Yes, uh, we uh, the entire uh, the, both uh, both uh, uh, Professor Foster and uh, Peter Cowan are alums. But, but I was 20 years old. <laughs> 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 uh, and uh, so we have full spectrum of people here on stage, and uh, we're happy to discuss. Uh, so we'd like to begin the discussion first. I'd like to bring up uh, the basic question that uh, that Gordon talked about is that most of the big problems that are facing humanity have already been solved. Is that true? Uh, what is the panel's, uh, what do you guys think about this? Is that something that uh, we should be worried about? Yeah, uh, no. I'd like to start with, yeah. Yeah, no. There's a lot of problems out there we haven't solved. We okay. Certainly in diseases, cancer, malaria, I mean, uh, AIDS, I mean, we could go on to things that we don't yet have a complete solution to. So I, I think it's simplistic to say that we have solved everything that needs to be solved. There's a lot of problems out there, and there's a lot of problems we're creating with our own success. I mean, there's pollution, there's shortages in certain areas. Uh, I'd say that people's lives today have more stress than they did years ago, and so there's more problems that are being created. I think there's constantly ways to solve problems, some by not having some magical breakthrough, but having small improvements that work towards innovations that solve problems, and I think there's more people and more capability to solve them, but there's still plenty of problems and evolving new ones. Okay, uh, I think his core thesis is absolutely nuts. Um, <laughs> and uh, just to illustrate, he thinks that growth is gonna come back down through innovation slowing and come back down to the historical pre-1800 average of 0.2 or 0.3 percent. And I think we all have lived in the last five years after the financial crisis where U.S. growth has come down from three and a half to about two percent, so it looks bleak but I'd argue that's a recency bias. I mean, if you look at the periods from 1500 to 1820, you had that two-thirds, two or 0.2, 0.3% growth, he cited. But basically, until from 1820 to 1900, you had 1.3% growth. It's a growth quadruple. From 1900 to 1950, it was 2%, it's global growth. From 1950 to 2000, 4%. And in the last 10 years, it's been a little bit under 6%. So if anything, I think his, the thesis should be the exact opposite, that because of innovation, growth is actually speeding up, and people have just lost track of that in the U.S. because of the short-term recency effect. That's great. So uh, I guess the next question then is, how do you think this growth has happened, and what are the things that, we're, uh, that we should do to continue them? Uh, and why does uh, what Dr. Foster believe that it's not going to be sustainable? What, what, are, the, what are the pitfalls over there? Well, I want to address, I think that uh, uh, that uh, Dr. Gordon is, uh, I think he's flawed in a lot of ways. First of all, he's tying innovation to GDP. And I think that that right off the bat is flawed. It's perfectly, one reason GDP can grow is because of certain population or demographic issues completely unrelated to technology. And secondly, just because there's innovation doesn't mean it's immediately reflected in what is uh, technology improvements within the, within the workforce, either better improvement or faster growth or capabilities. So that by coupling them together, I think he misses the point. I think the bigger point I want to say is economists typically look in the mirror, and I think they're looking, and they're looking behind them as to what's happened. As uh, somebody who invests in entrepreneurial companies and somebody who's seeing innovation and activity today, I think we're in the renaissance of activity. And I think economists are the kind of people often that know the cost of everything and the value of nothing. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing today is an incredibly fertile environment 
for more people than ever to start businesses, create, and a culture within America that encourages people to fail, try again, and keep going. Now, Silicon Valley is arguably the hub of it, but I'm seeing it all through Los Angeles, New York, Boston, and many other places throughout the country. And I'm very encouraged by what I'm seeing. And I think innovation is particularly ripe now, and the kind of capability that we have through is issues like you know, cloud computing, uh, outsourced capabilities, the confluence of increased speed and access to information, um, the ability for certain kinds of programming to be built and used already is allowing fewer people to start things faster, more effectively, and younger. And I just wanted to take one quote that I thought was particularly relevant here. And I wanted to say that I think it applies. It says, the young do not, do not know enough to be prudent and therefore try the impossible and achieve it generation after generation. And I think what's going on today is we've enabled more people at different ages, different skills, to have the complement of others to be able to try more and more. And I think we're real, really laying the groundwork for what is going to be a very innovative country and opportunity for the, next, for, for, for the foreseeable future. Just to take off on that, are we incentivizing that sort of risk taking in our uh, in our younger generation? Are we saying it's okay to go out and try something new and fail, or are we saying go to college, get that high paying job? You know, uh, is there pressure to do the, the run of the mill things that most people force us to do? Want me to answer? I sure. Any, it's open. To, any questions open to now? Anyone? So wants to what I'm seeing is the biggest changes. When I was going to school, there was money to be made on Wall Street, so everybody was enticed to go to Wall Street for the easy money game. What I'm seeing now, and I was the head of the Entrepreneur Association, when, and it was a small organization. I know it's now one of the bigger ones here, and I also know that it's getting to be not only cool, but inspiring to be an entrepreneur, to do your own thing, or to be part of a smaller company. And I think that that is a big change. I think the best and the brightest are now being brought in. They don't necessarily start a company right out of school. They may work for a bigger company, but the goal of a lot of people is to be with a company that they have a big impact on instead of being at a career at an IBM, say, for 25 or 30 years. They may start at a company, but they're looking to grow. And again, the culture of America is embracing the fact that you try something, it doesn't succeed, you try it again. And companies are saying, I want to hire somebody who failed once and wants to try it again. And I think that is embedded in American culture. And I think that's going to enable America, in particular, to survive in this, in this type of environment. That's great. Uh the other question, I guess, is then going forward, uh, given that the, if the environment is there, who needs to put in the effort? Is it every individual? Is it corporations as a whole? Does the government, does the government need to invest? Where does the impetus need to come from? All of the above, of course. Okay. <clears throat> because I think that it, the more balanced you can get from all those different uh, sectors, a higher probability of success. It just makes sense. Sure. Yeah. Hey, go ahead. Uh, going back to Peter's point, I think you need to separate out economic growth from one of its elements, which is productivity growth. And one element of productivity growth is technology. A technology fundamentally comes off kind of deep science, basic science research innovation. And I think that's an element that Gordon kind of confounded all those different elements. Because each of the four things are going different paces in the US. So when we talk about it, you need to say where exactly on that string you are to make coherent arguments about what different parties should be going. And entrepreneurs from, let's say, Anderson are very much going to be on the commercialization phase. We're not going to be inventing technologies. It's about taking them, applying them to social problems, and creating companies. Yeah, my, my issue with his presentation is that he focuses on one metric, GDP per capita. That's the metric that he sees the world in through that lens. And I look at it a little bit differently. I look at quality of life. And quality of life, to me, is think of all the technology benefits that have enhanced the quality of life. How many of you would like to go without your cell phone? The ability to quickly call somebody when you're walking down the street. That doesn't get reflected directly in GDP per capita. And I think he, he, he kind of looks through the historic lens of what events, inventions were made and what were the results, which is kind of looking at it from a correlation standpoint, correlating data not a causation of what caused the results. And I just think there's a lot of, as Peter brought up, there's a lot of things going on that are causes that just don't show up in the GDP numbers. <clears throat> and the quality of life 
factors. Uh, you know, think of uh, medicine. Think of the advances we've made in medicine. Think of the uh, healthier outcomes of uh, uh, CAT scanners, CT, uh, uh, various kinds like the Da Vinci robot. 85% of all prostate surgeries today are done by a robot. Less pain, more accurate, faster recovery. Those, th those things don't get reflected in his paper at all. And I think that we miss an opportunity <clears throat> because, hey, quality of life, what's all about? We enjoy, we have the longest longevity today that we've ever had in history. Again, that has some negatives in terms of health care and so forth, but our lives, the average lives, certainly in the United States today, is much better than it was when he relates to back in the 18, 1900s. So the quality of life to me is a lot more important than just GDP. Uh, I, I agree. I'd also add, I think there are a lot of components to making the country grow, succeed, take care of innovation. There's lots of pure science being done at schools across the country, across the world. Many of that pure science or those technology breakthroughs aren't realized because there's nobody there to take it and have some commercial innovation with it. And I think that remains to be a challenge in many other places, which is why today, with the entrepreneurial capability that's here and the idea that there's more people who can take ideas, try them, even in smaller steps, and have big breakthroughs. I mean, I, I want to talk about two technologies today that I think uh, perhaps um, uh, Dr. Gordon later on will, will have to eat crow on as the, as the innovation shows. And um, one of them is big data. So let's talk about this. Big data is something that's going on where we're taking advantage of information and capability that, that wasn't here a decade ago, maybe even five years ago. But that it's here doesn't mean anything. What people do with it, how they stream it, I mean, excuse me, how they use it, um, how they're able to parse it, what sort of intelligence they can gather it, and the different applications it can be used. And I want to give one example. There was, uh, when, when the, when the uh, crisis happened in New York, there was a problem, and uh, the gas stations didn't know how to deliver, I mean, the, uh, the refineries didn't know how to deliver the gas to the places where they were, uh, where people were. But by using an application called Waze, people were able to see where they were waiting online and deliver it. So it was using big data from common applications to solve a problem. And I think more of that's gonna happen. The second example is 3D printing. And I think that's gonna be a massive change allow a lot more people to do a lot more things creatively on a three-dimensional scale to create a lot more products. Yeah, I, I would say also the, <clears throat> again, the advent of cloud computing, the LAMP stack, the Linux, uh, Apache capability. I mean, you have high school seniors that are launching businesses while they're in high school that are successful. That was unheard of 10 or 15 years ago. And the cost of admission today is very low to get into business, and I think that's, a great, great uh, uh, a step forward. Uh, the other thing I, I heard that uh, we have 350,000 people in the United States today who are employed writing applications for cell phones. 350,000 people are making their living today writing apps. I think that's, a, you know, that's an indication of how technology is enabling people to start businesses very, very small and uh, launch them on the internet, get them on, on the Apple iPhone or Android store and make a living. Uh, I'd like to add one more technology to that, a favorite one of mine. Um, in 2003, DARPA funded their autonomous vehicle competition for the self-driving cars. They basically funded a, a string of these competitions. The technology was more or less done by 2007, 2008. No one did anything with it for another few years until Google of all the companies yeah. came and started testing it. Now think about the dollar and the social impact of that. Um, we lose about $100 billion a year in the U.S. just through waste of traffic time and fuel costs. If our cars drove themselves, that goes away. We lose another $100 billion in, in the car accidents through car insurance that we pay. That goes away. The, we have 33,000 people that die, and about another 2.5 million people get injured in car accidents. If you start quantifying that benefits, that's anywhere from $70 billion to $300 billion in terms of lower health care costs, life saves, and things like that. So just that one innovation, if you get the entrepreneurs and the government and everything together, you could see a 300 to 500 billion dollar annual impact in terms of the bottom line, plus tens of thousands of lives every year saved and not lost to the stupidest possible driving accidents. Not to mention all the jobs creating, creating the cars, creating the infrastructure. Sure. 
yeah. and having that, which is which is what innovation brings. Yeah, and that's a clear thing that that's going to happen in our lifetime. That's going to move GDP growth here and throughout the world. That people just don't talk enough about. Right. So that's those are great examples. Uh, but I want to come back to something that you guys mentioned, which is basic science research. Everybody, we mentioned that. Uh, I I want to ask if apart from the CAT scan and maybe a little bit of the, of the self-driving cars that we mentioned, most of the developments that you guys talked about was in technology. Peter Thiel, who's uh, one of the founders of PayPal, he, he has this quote in his founder's fund. He says, uh, we asked for flying cars, we got 140 characters. So uh, is it, are we focusing on the right types of innovation? What's the spread of innovation across? You know, and uh, Peter, you're probably best suited to answer this because you see a number of uh, open startups at companies. Well, you know, it, it, by the way, it's a very good question and it's a complex one. And uh, Peter Thiel and, uh, and Dr. Gordon aren't the only ones that raise the issue of where innovation is. I would simply say that uh, I think innovation is everywhere and it doesn't come specifically from deep science. It may start there. And I think the more people that participate in creating <coughs> businesses or something that comes out of this, there's going to be a lot more innovation. And who cares about flying cars is my question. If there is a demand, then the market will move there and will reward people. But today, what we're doing is, I think at the foundation is, we're creating enough jobs for people with some programming ability to create brand new products. We're creating people with, now that we've got the, um, you know, the, the entire system for the, for, for the genomes, uh, you know, we, we, have, we have now a, a template so that people who are less technical can innovate and create off of it. And I think there's always gonna be a balance between pure science and people figuring out a way to make it more, more uh, uh, valuable to society. And, and I think the shift is right now we're gonna see lots of people creating products and companies that are valuable, which will further reinforce deeper science and deeper innovation. Can we expect, and we do believe that uh, despite the lack of, uh, of ROI, maybe immediate ROI, to the country, people are willing to invest in some of these projects. That, is that a good assumption, or are we saying that the business will move, the climate will move such that the ROI will be available, and then the invention will happen? So, so for venture funds, and uh, I guess the, the venture funds rarely invest in something that's pure science. Venture fund takes something that's been pure science and moved along, and think there's going to be an ROI on it. Government sometimes reduces the risk, as they have in electric cars and certain sorts of. Uh, certain sorts of biotech and certain sorts of clean tech. Uh, there's a balance there that has to be struck. At the moment, interestingly, um, venture capital is shrinking, but the amount of investment coming out of non-venture sources is exploding. And so venture to date has often been somewhere between one to 4% of total investment in innovation. Right? So it, it's the most uh, visible and it's the most publicized and there are some very smart people who run them. But the amount of money going into other sorts of businesses uh, is unparalleled right now. And I think that that in turn, while not directly putting into pure science, will make the appeal of pure science more alluring to investors. Professor Foster, do you have a question? <coughs> There's a uh, interesting story of a company called Halloween. They developed a copier and uh, the Chester Carlson presented it to five different companies to buy it. IBM, uh, Kodak, two or three others, they all turned him down. He entered the market when there were 17 copiers already on the market. And the company called Xerox was founded within three years, they had 40% market share. So you don't have to be the first one into a market with a good idea. And Perseverance, uh, I think it was 12 years that he was spending to develop this product. So, you know, innovation comes from all, all sorts of different sources. It's great. It's, and it's also great to know that the culture is still alive in the country and there's a, a lot of things to look forward to. I didn't know about, about half of these technologies and companies before coming up here. So thank you so much for, for your time and your questions. Uh, I just wanted to see if you guys have any questions out of the audience. I think we have one over there.
couldn't monetize it, it didn't work out, it wasn't fast enough progress, and so we sort of let that go and, and moved on to something like, you know, like robotic surgery or less invasive surgery that we made exponential strides in that. Well, it seems to me that anytime you bring up an example, it's, I mean, it, to me it's somewhat arbitrary. I thought it was moved. So, uh, I mean, human beings haven't been able to run much faster, you know, in the last 20, 30 years, right? I mean, maybe the very fastest in the world. But I think there's certain things you're reaching for that the market is not telling you there's relevance. I mean, there used to be supersonic planes flying between London and New York. Uh, there were trade-offs, and people decided they weren't worth it. Uh, on the other hand, where the demand is for either better experiences where people now can communicate uh, via screen, whether uh, information can be extended in multiple ways, uh, those seem to be where the demand is and that's where it goes. And so I thought his example was poor and arbitrary in that regard. And if there's demand for people to get places faster, you know, in, 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 innovation will drive it. Right. Just to piggyback off that, so a lot of this stuff also depends on the basic science research being done, and whether there's kind of discontinuous upward kind of jumps in the science that's being done. So with the jet engine, the big discontinuity came from government and military spending, kind of through and after World War II to develop the jet engine. And that's mostly for fighter jets. And that was commercialized uh, by all the aircraft companies afterwards. So um, a lot of these things, you can look at it, the initial basic research can't be done by private industry. A government player, and the government never, never really got behind supersonic jets. There's no um, kind of real push to develop that technology. So it's not that we can't get better, it's just that there's been no coordinated central effort to, uh, to improve it. That's interesting. But I have often wondered why we haven't gone further than, than the jet airplane. So it's not, it's not so, it may be arbitrary, but it has, it, it has legs. I think about it. Well, it's economics. I mean, it costs just that much more to fly supersonic, to build the airplane, to withstand the elements, and so forth. I mean, look at the SST. Flew for, what, eight years? Had about four or five of them up, and uh, they crashed, and nobody ever commercially could come up with enough money to, uh, you know, start all over again. So I think economics plays a big, a big factor. And do we really need, you know, if you're going to London, uh, does it make any difference if it costs? Of New York, is it six hours versus three hours? I mean, it, it, the value is not there. We have a question after the one. Yeah. Uh, There's a Sorry, a couple of points. One of the things we brought up was that we needed innovation. And at the beginning of this talk, almost all three of you said that innovation is only one part of our growth. But you continued with every example was about innovation. And the, the point I want to bring is there's another talk by Jeffrey West, I think about two years ago, it was also on TED. And they compared cities and corporations and animal life to population. And they always reached a point where resources were being used exponentially faster as you grew until there was a new innovation that brought that back down. Um, we're growing. Uh, our innovations in the last five years, maybe other than the 3D printing, which I, which I feel can be a game changer, driving alone could be a game changer. I think uh, my question is that do we have an innovation big enough that can leapfrog us to not where we are today, but with our growth in the future. And you guys see that happening in the next five, 10, 20 years. Well, I certainly think in the DNA area and disease management, we can make significant leaps. I think we've done so in the last five years. So I think that's an area that you can, you, you can move forward, forward and generate rather quickly with great results. I guess one of the questions that comes out is, uh, sometimes, great scientific innovation can't be realized into something that has an impact for a while. I think we need to understand what that is. What has always uh, been of interest to me is that economic factors play, I think, a bigger factor in innovation than often people realize. And I think a couple of factors in America uh, are going to have an impact on America coming back and having more jobs, which might stimulate the economy even further. And that is you know, one of these things with um, uh, the extraction of oil, you know, that's, that's going on here. And the fact that now a lot, the certain costs can drop to do certain sorts of capabilities, research, certain sorts of products that can be made. And if they can be made less expensively, then, uh, then that may add other things as well that are beyond innovation. So I think your question is, things go beyond innovation, economic factors, 
government factors, government policy. Uh, just to change a little bit from your question, one of the things that scares me about America is I think there's a lot of foolish government policies by an intractable government, even though we're a democracy. And I think that's getting in the way sometimes of helping the economy grow while also protecting the financial environment against what I think is uh, some things that could, that could hurt the country with, uh, with people being able to get away too much in the financial systems. I think those all have, a, all have an impact on the growth of the economy, where innovation comes from, and where standard of living is enjoyed. So very particular institutional structures, kind of meta structures that are favorable for the US. You still have the best patent IP system in the world, hands down. And you still have the world's best research university system. I think something like 15 or 16 of the top 20 universities in the world that research are all American. And those meta institutions, again, it's not a zero, zero sum game. The rest of the world starts adop adopting these um, better IP regimes, better university systems, kind of down to the narrow things that make Silicon Valley so successful for, for even more specific things. That's a win win for everyone in the world. Um, one easy thing that even the entire US has not adopted yet. One of the weird legal structures that makes California better than, than most parts of the country is there's no employment restrictions in California. In other states, if you leave a company, they can stick a one or two year not compete on you, where you just kind of sit idle and don't do anything with all the knowledge and all the stuff you gain um, if you're an engineer. In California, that's banned by state law. So you basically can take everything you learned from startup A and go to a big company and go to startup B, and that sort of knowledge, informal, explicit, whatever, starts spreading around very, very quickly. So if you start taking a bunch of these little details, some of the big things, and start spreading throughout the US and certainly other parts of the world, I think it's a very positive kind of institutional um, set of structures for innovation and growth. So we have a question there. No? So it sounds like GDP per capita is maybe not the best way to measure innovation. Um, so if you guys were able to do Dr. Gordon's study over, how would you measure, measure innovation from the past, and perhaps how would you look at it going forward? Uh, and one of the things I would do is I'd look at the Economist Magazine's intelligence uh, department. They have the quality of life, which includes a GDP factor, but they also have other things. To, I think they have nine different factors, more balanced, all the way from gender equality to political stability to health, and I think that's a better gauge. Uh, and I might add, the last time I saw it, the United States was like 16th, and countries like Finland and Sweden and Norway were up in the top five. But I think that's a broader definition of the health of, of a country uh, and a better way to present it. I think it's a really good question you asked. And so I don't know, I think uh, Professor Foster answered it in a very good way. I might have a little different take and have to think about it more, but I think there'd be some kind of index about new sorts of jobs created. So for example, a, job, a new job at McDonald's isn't as important as a new software engineer in a new company, or a new sort of degree coming out of, uh, or a new OBGYN uh, sort of surgery. And I think there could be some index showing at the top end new types of jobs, uh, quality kinds of positions created, and that sort of index of the change of those kind of jobs, I think that is what drives many other factors. And uh, I'd also think the number of people, you know, uh, who I think one of the factors that I think is gonna be key in the future is the ability to attract and retain quality immigrants who wanna stay here and add to the innovative culture of, of where we are. So I, those sort of things I think would be better indices than what he put up. I can say that I, uh, I'm internally aware of what uh, you're kind of talking about there with immigration policies. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, as an immigrant, I can attest to the fact that I'm aware. Actually, Professor Gordon's paper that I read made a clear statement that said that you, we ought to have immigration rules <coughs> uh, to enlarge the H-1B sure. visa program for people who can add value technologically and innovative, which is a big issue that the Silicon Valley people have been pushing for years. Uh, there was somebody, I can't remember who it was, who said <coughs> we ought to award every single immigrant who comes to the United States and gets a PhD in engineering or science uh, you know, a visa, a visa right on the spot. Oh, you can, you can speak loud enough, please go ahead. All right. Um, you guys were talking about how innovation in an environment that fosters um, failing and taking risks and failing and trying again were two of the critical factors in progress. And I was wondering what you guys thought about that considering that the 
those two things are two of the things that the Ameri American education system seems to be getting knocked around for lately. Well, I, and one thing that I know that uh, Peter and I are involved in the Tech Coast Angels, and we actually value more a, a, a startup CEO that has tried before and for some reason didn't succeed. We spend a lot of time finding out why, but that takes a lot of guts. It takes a lot of guts to do it in the first place. It also takes even more guts to come back a second time and say, hey, I want to try this again. But those are the kind of people you want, risk takers. Um, Peter and I also spend time working with foreign countries and companies, startup companies in those countries, Finland, Italy, <coughs> New Zealand, Australia, they do not have that sense of it's okay to fail. If you fail in those countries, it's real tough to get anybody excited about working with you again. But I, but I think it's, I think it's an American thing. It's very healthy. I think, I think we all win. I think to add to that, one of the things that goes in our favor too is, at least in, in some of these high tech centers like Boston, the Valley, Colorado, there's an emphasis that it's not as much on having a bunch of degrees. So dropouts are given a chance. And having been to other parts of the world, or Tokyo, or kind of other so-called high-tech centers, in no other part of the world, Bangalore or wherever, um, London, are 19, 20, 21-year-old dropouts given a $5 million investment to start a company. So um, that trend should accelerate. You know, people like Peter Thiel are trying to push it. Um, but that is still a remarkable thing that people should try to encourage. Yeah, I wanted to highlight one thing that really stood out about America. Last year, I was invited to speak at a national conference in China on innovation. And when we were there, their basic quandary was they wanted to have an American to get balanced. And they said, China is the new world power. Everything's coming here. But here's our problem. We don't really invent anything. We have, what we have is we have a lot of people who work very hard. They're very hardworking engineers. And we have companies that are set up, but they're really set up because that the, uh, the government has so much control that there's really not the innovators and the best aren't kept up as those who have the best relationships with government. Then they said, how do we become innovative? And they laughed and said, the only, you know, the only choice we have really is to go to Silicon Valley, learn some things, try to bring it back, while meanwhile we're not allowing any American companies to come in and compete against this. And it really highlighted that that's supposed to be a threat. And I'm saying, look how well America's positioned as more of these resources are available to more people in smaller groups. But I think that's gonna be the demise, much like Many years ago, you know, 20, 25 years ago, we thought Japan was poised to become the superpower. I think China's gonna fall the same way. I may have, uh, I had about 50 Chinese people who were very successful come to me and go, by the way, I've got a house in America in case I get kicked out of China or they come to take me. Because this is a place where I think innovation is embraced. And I think that's why, we're, that's why I think Professor Gordon's, I mean, Dr. Gordon's so off base in what he's saying. All right, so it turns out that we're actually out of time. We've had an uh, interesting and very, very uh, so I'd like to thank the panel uh, for their expertise and their knowledge. Thank you so much.